Hello there, kia ora. Welcome to this post-budget special. I'm joined again by Blake and the brilliant Clint Smith, the numbers man himself. Um, hey. First of all, holding up there, Clint, you, you've gone through everything, headaches subsided, stop crying in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a lot to digest, but I think I've got my head around the budget now. Yeah, so. Um, with, with the announcement yesterday, what an announcements, was there anything that sort of jumped out at you as being a surprise? I think um, in some ways I was surprised that they did exactly the uh, the tax cuts that had been presaged, uh, presaged before the election. So uh, that was interesting. But, um, you know, essentially we always knew it was going to be a bit of a meh. You know, it was going to be 10 bucks, 15 bucks, 20 bucks a week, two bucks for a lot of people. And actually it doesn't, it doesn't solve the cost of living crisis. It doesn't change the world. Um, on the cut side, they kind of did what you would do um, if you if you had to make cuts and you didn't want to make too many headlines, which is do small widespread cuts rather than um, big programs. Um, by and large, although there are some programs that are gone that I think are going to generate some headlines. Such as? Um, well, in the disability sector, um, the... Um, the minimum wage um, subsidy gone, you know, um, uh, on in the disability sector and uh, certainly in the sort of the, uh, the the workers' rights side of the left, this has been a huge issue for a long time that disabled people were allowed to be unemployed at below the minimum wage um, for exempt employers. And um, Labour last year finally, you know, said, no, we're going to fix this and we're going to subsidise um, th those employers, but make sure that the disabled person is getting the minimal, the actual minimum wage, the same as anyone, anyone else. And um, to see that reversed, you know, ch taking out I think about fifty million dollars, um, which ultimately is fifty million dollars, ultimately actually comes out of disabled people's pockets. Um, and um, you know, and we, that money is, you know, financing the tax package. So you know, that I think that's quite a disappointment. Um, it's, yeah, so, so something that I, I speak, think speaks to values that don't align with mine. Yeah, that's a great segue, actually. Clint, for you to set up for me. So that's good. Um, so $1.9 billion supposedly going into disability. So it sounds good in uh, retrospect. But when you look at it, it's not actually that great because even though it's welcome, most of it goes into mm. probably buildings watch to 99.8% of us in the community, including myself, could be good, but at the same time, it's not actually that great because it doesn't really help with any of the mm. other issues that we have been advocating for, as you might have seen on my Cycles and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I should disclose I, I I do some work with the Disability Support Network, just providing them with some advice. And you know, we, we've been uh, really tr making the case strongly to government that these those providers need enough money to keep up with the growing demand and the growing complexity of demand and and, and raising um, costs. Um, and um, and we calculated that they would need about what they've got just to you know keep the lights on. So it sounds like a lot of money, but actually it's 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 just shooting water for those organisations which are already uh, doing it pretty tough. And as you say, it doesn't address um, wider issues for the disabled community. Um, um, at, you know, at access issues, housing issues, all those kind of things, and. Um, it also doesn't ad address the pay equity um, for the care and support workers, uh, which we know is an, an ongoing thing. A lot of those workers have you know, seen their wages um, fall in real terms. They're barely minimum wage now, and um, they're, they're owed a, a lot. Uh, um, there should be a, a fair deal for them, and um, the government needs to come to the party because ultimately they're the ones who, who fund that system. Um, but you know, it's, it, it will cost a it will cost a decent chunk of change, and the government just doesn't seem to view that as a priority. 
as I've said in many, many, many of my videos, like, the thing that I find most astonishing is that, like, the ministers themselves have connection to the stable community and they, and I don't want to sound, you know, like, oh, you know, all this, 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 but they don't seem to care. They don't seem to be mm. bothered. And I find that utterly astonishing. By the way, cheap plug, my petition will be delivered on June 26th for those people mm. here at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, there was a lot of hope around Penny Simmons as um, as Minister for uh, Disabled disability issues um, given her lived experience with it um uh obviously she um made a hash of things earlier in the year and was pretty quickly moved on by luxon out of the role uh i think uh louise upston um you know we've already seen she was the one who brought through the disability uh cuts earlier uh, sorry the the benefit changes earlier this year which it, it resulted in lower benefits um, and I think she's going to take a pretty hard-nosed attitude. Um, you know, she talks a lot about the sustainability of the sector, which means money, too much money. And well, where does that money cut? Where's that money going to at the end of the day? What are you going to cut? Um, it's not going to be good for disabled people, that's for sure. I was just wondering, was there anything in the budget that you actually like? Um, I mean, I, I was I was glad to see that. Um, Disability support services at least got enough to to meet the cost pressures. Uh, I was concerned it wouldn't be enough. Um, you know, other sectors um, certainly didn't get enough. Um, the, yeah. Um, apart from that, um, I, the, the, there's some bits I'm, I'm, I was sort of worried were going to go. Um, I thought they might get rid of the warmer Kiwi Homes program entirely. Um, they've cut it back, um, but at least, you know, it's, it's still there to a degree. Um, so, yeah, the, I guess the thing's not been as bad as I feared uh, in a few places is, is where it's at for me. Um, you know, the prescription charges back on, I just, I think this is a terrible policy, but I was concerned that they'd actually increase them uh, because that's what treasury has been recommending for years that it should be ten dollars per prescription not five that kind of thing so um yeah i think what like i say what they've done is kind of spread the spread the cut cuts and spread the pain quite broadly so that people aren't going to immediately feel that but what you might what you'll find over time is instead a degradation of the system Certainly what happened under the last national government was you didn't the health system didn't go to pot in year one, but after five years of not getting enough money, that's when it starts to really become a crisis. It's when you start to notice the mould growing on the walls at Middlemore. Yeah, exactly right. Um, one of the things that jumped out for me is, is just a weird little line in there um, was actually the tax take from tobacco imports. It... it seems mm. to me like, like the number decreasing i kind of understand if the number of people smoking is dropping but when you look at things like the alcohol tax and port sort of revenue that's on the increase and you'd think that drop in numbers of people drinking would have the same effect sorry is there something there that mm. I, I, am i seeing something there that's not there or does that imply that there are changes around excise tax and how they work for those kind of products, which has always kind of been a slam dunk for any government in terms of revenue gathering. Yeah. I mean, they they are putting up tobacco excise. I mean, I think it's been going up at 10% a year for a long time now. Um, uh, cigarettes are actually very expensive now. Um, uh, so few, few people smoke that um, people don't realise, but you know, they're very expensive. Um, and... Um, I think that I mean, that what what Treasury will be saying is, yeah, we're going to keep on putting up the excise, but we also think that smoking rates are going to decrease. Obviously, not by as much as they would have under the previous policies, um, but they they sit down and do their models and try and get as close as they can on on alcohol. Um, yeah, alcohol consumption is falling, but um, per person, but not not by as much. I think total alcohol consumption 
across the population is, is relatively flat, um, whereas tobacco use is, is falling. That makes sense. Yeah. Not being a numbers person, I'm just going, that looks like a really sharp drop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anything else you like from this um, budget, Clint? Well, um, I I was worried that the unemployment numbers projections were going to be worse. Um, uh, it's it's they're not great I mean, projections. You know, though. Five, no, no, that no, they're not. Five point three percent is not good, and it, you know it means another thirty odd thousand people out of work by the middle of next year. And at the same time as they're saying, well, we're going to clamp down on the number of people on the benefit. Well, who falls in the gap then, right? There's more people out of work, but we don't want so many people getting the, the doll. So, someone falls between those two stools, right? Um, but um, they're still, I mean, I was worried we were going to see it more like 6% um, or worse. So um, some of those projections are, are a little bit better than I feared. Um, I guess the the question now is, you know, this is kind of the apex of this government's agenda. You know, all we ever heard was we're going to fix the cost of living crisis up to two hundred fifty dollars a fortnight. Of course, nobody gets that two fifty. There's a bit of a mirage. You know, fix the cost of living crisis, tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts. Now that's done. Now we we get our two bucks or our ten bucks or our twenty bucks. What's the actual plan now? You know. Well, uh, uh, this isn't going to grow the economy. This is just a shuffling of some money around uh, in a very small way. It's, there's nothing to boost production, nothing to create jobs here. So, um, you know, I think that's the the question for this government going forward: is it what next? Is this it? The thing that really got me was like, was I, what I took away from the budget is. Those cancer things that them from they've been promoting for months just seem to be nowhere. Just seem to be onto that burner. Yeah. You know, no talk about it. What happened? Yeah, yeah, and I think, I mean, it's obviously like it, it's a a strange values decision because they could have just delayed the landlord tax cuts by a few months to pay for that. You know, not they didn't even have to cancel them. They could have just delayed them. Um, so there's a strange values thing. I also think it's strange politics because they made such a song and dance of that policy. Um, they got so many people's hopes up. Um, well, why not just do it? You know, um, it, it's not going to break the bank. Um, they had other, like I say, they could have delayed the landlord tax cuts by four months and that would have paid for the, the those cancer drugs, but they chose not to. And, um, I think that's a strange decision morally, and I think it's a strange decision politically. Well, when you take a look through the budget, is there anything that you sit there and go, well, this is quite clearly driven by ACT, or quite clearly driven by National, or quite clearly driven by by New Zealand First? Is, is, is there sort of a shape in there that tells you what their priorities were going into the budget negotiations? Yeah, I mean, um, New Zealand First is very much out to get the money for the stuff they care about. You know, it's quite sort of narrowly focused, so um, no cut to um, uh, foreign affairs funding, once Peter's as Minister of Foreign Affairs, and getting that money for the um, the Regional Growth Fund, um, Shane Jones's latest um, growth fund. Um, so, yeah, they very much got their priorities. Um, ACT would have liked to see uh, much deeper cuts, and um, it's come out this morning that they proposed a much uh, more expensive tax cut package that would have been funded by much deeper cuts so it actually didn't really get their way on this um i think you're seeing instead that luxon's going you know here's some money for charter schools um here's some money for your your uh, maori wards referendum uh you know that that kind of act that kind of thing has been um getting smaller things rather than the big transformations that they hope for is it one of those things then with, with at, well, the precarious situation that the coalition's in at the best of times because there's so many people involved with it. Um, do you think this is something that the parties are sort of squared and going, yep, this is what we're going to deal with, so that's fine? Or do you think it might cause some tension along the lines of, you know, Winston didn't get his stuff cut, so why is my stuff not being paid that much attention? Yeah, I, um, the, 
a situation like this, a three three way um, government where each party effectively has the veto because you need each of them to make a majority, it is inherently a very dynamic and complicated situation. Um, and uh, when Jacinda Ardern had the same situation in 2017, um, she used her personal relationships. You know, she had a very good personal relationship with Winston Peters and the Greens' uh, willingness to, to make things work uh, really well to, to keep that all above board. This government seems much more fractious, you know, that they they seem to come into conflict publicly quite a, a bit more than... Um, than under our doing. So uh I guess ev- every every decision is a negotiation because you need them every time. Uh and um even if you you try to say, okay, you get this thing, they get this thing, you know, you, you you're still um depending on um on both parties and national going to each decision going yes okay i'll do that and um that can build up right like um i think once winston is no longer deputy prime minister and he's looking towards the next election and how he's going to market himself as the the champion of the little guy and and the true speaker that that's when things will start to be interesting and also if um there's any move to privatize uh public assets such as there's a lot of talk about kiwi bank at the moment or um, the ferries, those kind of things. You know, Peters is meant to be quite strongly anti-privatisation. Um, he, you know, walked away from the Shipley government in '98 over privatisation of public assets. So um, that's something where uh, you could see that consensus uh, and that very that very delicate balance of having to, get, having to get everyone on board for every decision. It could start to break down. On current polling, we have seen that he may not even make it back into government whenever this election does mm. occur. So that, that's a worrying sign for Mr. Peters. Um, if I could ask you the, the generic question that I've been asking all of, or a majority of our guests this week. So uh, to get, I've been watching a lot of the uh, galas and awards that Mr. Luxon has been attending, and he seemed to get quite a cold reception whenever he appears on stage. But if, as soon as uh, he mentions the uh, opposition, they get a big ovation um, and he had to awkwardly acknowledge them and say, oh, yeah, let's cheer for them too and all that kind of thing. So how worrisome is that so early in a government term, in your opinion? Yeah, if I, if I was sitting there as a national party strategist, that would worry me um, because you're meant to get a boost when you come into government. Um, you know, the, you, you, the public has just kicked out a government they didn't want anymore. They've got you instead. They're meant to be happy with that decision. <laughs> and um, and uh, it's evident that that's not really the case. Um and, and yeah, some of that public creation to license is quite interesting. It's a bit almost like, you know, Trump never got a honeymoon when he became president, right? Um, you know, he'd he'd beaten Hillary just um, and by dint of their system, um, but he never sort of got that boost. And I think Luxon's kind of in the same thing, and I think you know, Luxon clearly like really enjoys the stuff about the office of prime minister he really enjoys the photos of him going on to uh, the air force planes and going off and having the pictures with the uh with, um other world leaders and all those kind of things and i think he kind of what was it man uh, eden park this morning with the you know national banners everywhere and yeah 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 and i kind of think he expected that he would get more uh adoration for the office he holds, uh, but it's not. It's not really how it is. It, it's it is whether you're what you're personally delivering, whether people uh, like you or not. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's it's not the position you want to be in. If um, if you're a national strategist, you're saying no. We've 
this is not a comfortable position to be in six months into our first term. Yeah, but the fact that the ovations are getting around it is so, mm. so, so, so bad. The only thing I could compare it to is like um, Sunak and uh, the uh, UK at the moment. Mm-hmm. He's having the same sort of issue. Yeah, and like Sunak is at, what, he's the fifth uh, Tory prime minister, you know, of a 14-year government. Like, you know, he's at the the diseased end of a government that's got <laughs> time to die. Uh, this this shouldn't be the position that um, a new prime minister finds himself in. Um, and, and this, you know, goes back to the thing that, like, um, it was a... Um, Labour kind of lost the election rather than people saying, yeah, we, we love the vision that likes this point forward. He was never that personally popular. And um and um it, it's kind of on, on Labour also to find how are they what are they going to offer that's going to be um a positive alternative if they want to win in twenty six. Um because this government does look very beatable, but um Labour will have to get their act together um, to, to present an alternative to win back those votes. And there's not too many that they need, but they, they do need to win back that centre. Do you think that do you think that um, a lot of the voters that um, had whipped over are they seemingly have uh, regretted, their, regretted their move? Mm. I mean, I think that's what the polling shows, right? Like, um, that um, the the fact that the government's polling is deteriorating this early in in, in the cycle uh, shows that uh, people aren't getting what they expected, and and you know this goes back to tax cuts. You know, um, Labour people out on the campaign trail in um, last year were being say saying, "Look, I, I vote Labour normally, but cost of living's high. This guy's going to give me two hundred fifty bucks. I, I got to vote for him." It well, turns out it wasn't two hundred fifty bucks, was it? That was that was all a bit of a con, and so um, you know people are seeing that now, and they're also j- just all the other stuff the government's doing that no one expected the tobacco um, changes, the the anti climate change stuff, the the mining public land, the uh, anti Maori rhetoric, the, the the disability stuff that no one voted for that, and um, so you kind of step outside. Um, the the expectations of voters, and they do say, "Oh, this is actually what I wanted." Um, I believe Labor's in the process at the moment of going back to the board in terms of what they're looking at offering for the next election in terms of taxes and policies and stuff like that. The rebuild process, which happens after any election, how does an event like yesterday's announcements with the budget impact that decision making process? It it does sort of set the um. I guess the fiscal parameters that you have um, it, when you're a major party, you do have to be able to get up and say, we can afford the policy um, proposals that we're going forward as a, as a whole. If you're a minor party, you can put out quite a few proposals and say, look, we're not going to get all of them. So it doesn't need to add up as a, as a whole package. Um, but so Labour will be looking at those forward fiscal projections and saying, okay, um, this is how much money we're going to have. Do we need to get more revenue to afford the the investments and the, and the policies that we think are important? If so, where do we get that revenue from? Um, and what what's the debt situation? Is it too hard to look? I think um, it's quite important um, that Labour doesn't get in, into the mistake of um, framing debt as, debt as the problem. Um, borrowing for tax cuts, blah blah blah, kind of implies that there's not enough money to go around, and and that then says, oh, well, yeah, we do have to cut back spending because there's too much debt. Actually, the problem isn't the debt; it's that they chose to do the this massive tax cut package that, apart from landlords, people get very little from, and as a result, they are cutting back on public services. That should be the the choice should be irresponsible tax cuts for landlords versus public services, not um, 
uh, debt versus tax cuts. So, if you were Mr. Hipkin, would you keep pushing the narrative that um, you're given too much money to the landlords? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it it is just like outrageous. <laughs> Three billion dollars. Uh, it's it's. It's just so much money to such a small group who are already wealthy, and um, that money has to come from somewhere, and it's come out of um, disability services, it's come out of um, prescription charges, it's come out of um, put, putting up public uh, fares, it's, cut, it's, it's why there's so little extra money for health and education. And it's not good economic policy, because you, you've you're incentivizing people to invest in, in the non-productive economy and spend their money bidding up the price of houses against each other rather than invest into the productive economy. So it's, it's, it's a terrible policy all around. And, and, and the good thing politically about it is that um, it's a known entity. When you propose a new tax, you get this little, what I call the sum of all fears problem. No one especially if it's kind of vague, no one really knows if it's going to apply to them. Am I going to be paying you tax? How much more tax am I going to pay? If, if Labour says, look, we're going to, rest- we're, we're going to restore the, um, the removal of interest deductibility for landlords, it was, oh, yeah, we know that that is. That was what used to be there. And, it's, and it raises money straight away as well, whereas some of these tax proposals, you don't actually get any money into the government coffers for five, ten years. And... Um, so yeah, I, I I would be, yeah, keeping on that the landlord tax cuts were a, were a mistake on all those grounds. Is it a little bit of a shell game though when it comes to borrowing with this budget? You know, we're not we're not borrowing for tax cuts; we're borrowing for operational costs. But we're doing these tax cuts, which are a large chunk, well, large in terms of value that we're looking in what we're borrowing. Is, is it a shell game? Is again not an economist, don't know, but it feels like that to yep. somebody from the outside. Yeah, I mean, the tax cut package costs fifteen billion dollars, right? So you could go, well, rather than do that tax cut package, we are going to spend fifteen billion dollars more on public services, or going to have fifteen billion dollars less debt, or a combination of those things. Um, I just think that emphasizing debt too much then says that the, the spending cuts are okay. Um, because yeah, you, you, you know, there's a, there's a, it's, it's all a question of priorities. Where does that, what is the top priority for that $15 billion? The government said the top priority for that $15 billion is tax cuts with a large chunk of that to landlords. Um, I would say the priority for that money is public services. Um, and, uh, others might say the priority is, less debt but then they're accepting that public service cuts and this are a lower priority and i don't agree oh i was just going to say what are you going to do now that it's over is it is it sort of like after a marvel movie comes over and you watch it and you're like oh, okay now what do i do, <laughs> <laughs> what do I i'm do just now? getting ready for my 20 bucks a week i'm just so excited for my 20 bucks a week tax card i'm just uh you know giddy you mean you're not getting uh, so... the 250 dollars that everyone was promised <laughs> <laughs> so uh Thanks for joining us, um, Clint. Uh, thank you for watching.